Bugle, audio newspaper for a visual world. Hello, Buglers. Uh, Bajornio Los Bugleros for our European listeners. And welcome to issue 4151 of The Bugle. I am... Uh, I'm not really sure anymore. Uh, I mean, my name is Andy Zoltzen, but uh, who am I? Uh, I mean, it's a it's a difficult question to answer. It's I've no <laughs> idea. Uh, time and date have ceased to exist as concepts. Uh, in fact, I don't know much anymore. What I do know is, if I had a hammer, I'd probably accidentally put a nail through a water pipe again. If we were if we allowed and indeed <laughs> taught pigeons to drive, they'd probably stop taking jealousy shits on our cars. The <laughs> volcano. An erupting mountain of pasta that splurts bolognese sauce all over the place when served could be the dish that saves the restaurant industry. And when all this is over, the first thing we should do is have a global ceremony at, at which all seven point whatever billion of us nod sagely and say, yeah, we f***ed up a bit there, didn't we? Um, it's uh, still <laughs> strange times, Buglers. I'm pretty sure at some point this week the lockdown started going backwards. Uh, and as sure as breakfast follows lunch, I woke up the day before I thought I'd gone to bed. But anyway, here we are. It is Friday the 1st of May 2020 and joining me from uh, Australia, uh, Alice Fraser. H- how are you, Alice? I am well, Andy Zaltzman. I spent the morning with my adorable baby niece, so everything is everything is good in the world. Uh, and then I found a red back spider in the pool filter and that took things downhill in rapid order. <laughs> how big is it? Are they, are they, are they quite small? They're about that big. They're very beautiful, the female right. redback spiders, uh, but th- they will kill a child. And importantly, right. I was with a child. <laughs> <laughs> right, I see. That's a bit a bit of an issue. Well, I guess you know if there's a message from this uh, this week's bugle, it is death to all spiders. Uh, joining us from <laughs> it's that New the York- spider owns that pool now. <laughs> uh, joining us from New York City. Welcome back to Josh Gondelman. Uh, hi, hi, Josh. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me great to have you back how are how are things in new york well i haven't seen any spiders but the rats have become incredibly confident (laughs) the city's rats they're no longer scurrying they've got kind of like a swagger to their walk now when they right and i've seen them crossing the street which again feels ambitious (laughs) i don't i don't like a rodent that has like a megalomania to them it's a green man not a green rat at the crossing Absolutely, and also it's probably a, a good time to be a rat when you th- think of the history of uh, you know, human pandemics. You know, this is one that they are absolutely off the hook on, and they're probably thinking, <laughs> "Well, you know, let's just let's just enjoy it while we can." I feel like they're worried because they got blamed for the last plague, and I think they're like, "Don't pin this shit on us." <laughs> <laughs> also, possibly taking confidence from their their president as well. So, um, uh, we are recording on the first of May, twenty twenty. May Day, May Day. Never a more appropriate day to record a satirical podcast than May Day of this year. Um, uh, the uh, it's interesting the the origin of May Day as a distress signal. Um, there are various theories as to how this came about, the term May Day, May Day. Uh, one is that uh, because May Day, the uh, uh, day, signalled the approaching of summer, if you're in the correct hemisphere, of course, uh, the medieval church issued a May Day warning to alert its priests to the fact that the warmer weather could lead to an increase in licentious behaviour and diabolous <laughs> groinular urges. Hence, May Day, May Day, May Day would be... Uh, Um, sung from the the church rooftops. Um, Another theory is that the uh, notoriously panicky, risk-taking and accident-prone 19th century British general Greville Yard Montclotchet would often often (laughs) implement high-risk battlefield strategies. But when things went wrong, he would struggle to admit that he'd messed up and start stumbling on his words in a kind of Hugh Grant style um, and say, I've I've made a, made a, uh, made a... um, (laughs) And you know, the rest of his uh, his staff w- w- would see that as a as a sign that things had, had taken a terrible terrible turn. Uh, and a third theory is that it dated back to Henry the Eighth's time, and when he was choosing a wife, uh, choosing a new wife to replace the one that he'd recently. Uh, uh, shall we say, separated from in one of his various modes of separation, which came, of course, in various degrees of physical literalism. When he was choosing a new wife, he liked to be presented with a selection of anonymous portraits of eligible princesses, noble women, and or just assorted young hotties. These would be labelled Maid A, Maid B, Maid C, through to Maid J, very much like Goal of the Month, but with 16th century women. Uh, He used the term maid so he wouldn't be swayed by their social status, only their looks and personality as, as, as painted 
created by the skillful portrait artist of the day. Anyway, on one occasion, shortly after swiping down on his previous date, stroke wife, he picked the first portrait, uh, uh, or made A. Uh, that was of the Transylvanian Countess Enid Dracula, who had a reputation for being, shall we say, something of a man-eater. Hen uh, Henry's courtiers and Lord Snutterbridge, the recently appointed Pimp Royal, who'd uh, replaced the executed Lord Nantwich, knew that Countess Enid would be a catastrophic wife for Big Henry, panicked and shouted, Mayday, 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 and summoned up an emergency short-term Catherine from the Crown Reserve of Catherine's to distract Henry whilst a far less <laughs> flattering portrait of Enid was painted. Anyway, those are the theories, I guess. We'll never know. Anyway, the uh, May Day caller, about 100 years ago now, uh, replaced uh, in um, the early days of aviation the previous alarm message of holy f***ing shit, 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 this is what happens when we f***ing play with physics. Henry VIII, very much the pioneer of conscious uncoupling. <laughs> <laughs> As always, a section of the bugle is going straight uh, in the bin. Uh, well, a free giveaway this week uh, in the bin, an automatic clapper uh, when you want to express your appreciation for someone doing a socially useful job but don't really have the time to do it yourself. Uh, simply play this sound effect from your phone. Uh, and also in the bin, uh, poetry, or poetry as, as discussed, has had a real resurgence during the, uh, during the, the lockdown. And our in-house poet, Gannicus Straffage, uh, uh, has uh, written for us uh, his latest poem about the current situation. Coronavirus. You are only small, not tall at all. You are far from big, unlike a large pig. You are tiddly in size, therefore harder to see than wasps or flies. You are not bulky, but you seem quite sulky. Nevertheless... You are a massive <laughs> That was uh, Coronavirus by Gannicus Straffage in the bin. It's very William McGonagall levels of class right there. <laughs> I like it I, I like it because it rhymed and then it didn't. That's the twist. <laughs> <laughs> like all the best poems. Yeah. Switch it up. Top story this week. Children versus the virus. Uh, well, this coronavirus, in common with uh, most uh, other major political figures of our times, has generally not bothered itself with children and has focused mostly on the old. Um, but children around the lockdown world have been having a tough time of it. They have been, uh, well, climbing up the walls, frankly, which is good exercise and, uh, you know, something to do. Again, it helps them learn about physics and statistical risk and uh, how to administer elementary first aid to themselves. But... These are interesting times for a generation that will carry the effects of this crisis, this lockdown and its aftermath, through the rest of this century in their personal and and working lives. Alice, you are um, our correspondent for uh, everyone on the planet uh, under the age of, um, well, let's say, well, 44, uh, which is how I see uh, children <laughs> at my age. Um, what, uh, what is the news from the world of kids? <laughs> Well, exciting news out of Switzerland. Children are now allowed to hug their grandparents again, so all the battles for Omar's respect, love and the inheritance of Nazi gold, Edelweiss and timepiece fortunes can begin again. <laughs> uh, actually, it's not just that they're allowed to hug their grandparents. In Switzerland right now, hugging your grandparents is compulsory, even if they smell weird or are bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of nice, but I think the kids will agree it's way more exciting and badass to hug your grandparents while it's still illegal. It's like a little, you know, I guess they're a little punk. <laughs> yeah, it's the never really been death. a kind of extreme sport or, you know, a sort of countercultural expression of uh, of rebellion. Yeah, the last two months, hugging your grandparents has been the coolest it's ever been. <laughs> Real edgy. Also, if kids can't have... You know, if kids don't get coronavirus, but they can still be carriers, it's just like a nation full of tiny, adorable Grim Reapers. <laughs> well, it was always the kids who wouldn't hug anyone that you used to suspect of being sociopaths. But now when a hug might be a death sentence, you you have to wonder about the real huggy kids. <laughs> a Swiss scientist has claimed that children cannot transmit the virus. Other scientists have claimed that children can transmit the virus. So, you know science you are really not covering yourself in glory at the moment a third set of scientists claim that children are the virus 
<laughs> but because it's Switzerland, they're going to pretend not to take a stance and that any either science <laughs> side could be right. <laughs> it only applies to Swiss children. That Swiss children are unique in not transmitting the virus. Uh, I guess if that's the case, we have to ask why. Is it you know their genetic neutrality, as you suggested? Uh, is it uh, an excess of mountains? Is it holes in cheese? Or is it, I think, most likely that Swiss children have been brought up exposed to the single-handed backhand in their star tennis players? That having grown up watching <laughs> Roger Federer and Stanislas Wawrinka playing with such beautiful, elegant single-handed play, they, that's made them less susceptible to the virus than the Spanish and Serbian children who've grown up watching the more functional, less aesthetically pleasing two handed backhands of the likes of Nadal and Djokovic. Um, we don't know. I guess these are one of some of the many things that science will have to study as we learn more and more about this virus. Also, the, the, in Switzerland, it's, it's only children under 10, uh, apparently, who do not transmit the COVID virus and can hug their, uh, their gra- grannies and granddads. Under, under 10, <laughs> specifically, as soon as you... I don't know if the coronavirus has a bit of an OCD thing about single-figure numbers, uh, or sim- simply that on their 10th birthday... Swiss children become lethal vectors of contagion, as we've already always uh, suspected them uh, uh, to be. Uh, an- another angle on this is that scientific research has also suggested that it's at precisely the age of 10 that the human brain starts to develop an understanding of the concept of inheritance, which is why um, <laughs> the Swiss government doesn't want children aged 10 or over risking their grandparents' uh, lives. Well, they are taking some precautions, right? Like when when you make physical contact with your grandparents, you have to use some PPE. You have to hug them through the holes in a piece, a large piece of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coming of age thing, you know. When yeah. you're ten, you put on your long pants, you take your hair down, and you stop hugging your grandparents. Mm-hmm. It's like a bar mitzvah for Swiss people. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Also for teens, right? You don't want teenagers haven't been touching anyone in weeks. You don't want someone hugging their own grandparents becoming physically aroused. The hormones are out of control. <laughs> Family show, Josh. It's actually very similar to a bar mitzvah in that uh, when you come of age in Switzerland, you get some Jewish gold. It's just <laughs> <laughs> not from your relatives. Meanwhile, in Spain, Spanish children are allowed out for the first time in six weeks. They're allowed out to play in the streets and they can return to their traditional pastimes of eating tapas at midnight, bullfighting and staring morosely out of an oil painting at you wearing full child-sized adult clothing while someone with dwarfism does menial tasks in the background. (laughs) Well, that is such such stereotype, Alice. That is not what Spanish (laughs) kids do. What Spanish kids do is, you know, just traditional cultural Spanish activities like riding a bicycle for weeks on end, patiently passing a football through midfield, or looking at a pig and thinking, your legs, my tum, it's a date in 18 months' time, (laughs) or more if I'm treating myself. Well, apparently Spanish people have been taking the time in quarantine to stock up on their siestas, so when the lockdown stops, nobody will be allowed to take a siesta for another eight months. (laughs) You know, it's a great time for people to be allowed to go outside in Spain. It's almost uh, electronic music and ecstasy season on the beaches. (laughs) (laughs) Just a beautiful time. But there there are concerns that there there aren't going to be enough people to harvest all the ecstasy and electronic music (laughs) this year due due to the lockdown. So there there could be lots of electronic music that just goes to waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those fat beats rotting in the fields. Yeah. I really the goal behind this right is to let the children out is to avoid turning an entire generation into a nation of competitive esports champions and I think that's <laughs> noble. <laughs> They're just going to get too good at gaming if they have to stay inside. You don't want competitive esports players. When when you play sports and esports at the same time, the winner is always um friendship or in the case of esports loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the real the real victory in esports is the friend you didn't make along the way. <laughs> here, here in Britain, there's talk of a, a phased reopening of, of of schools, despite many in the Conservative government deciding that schools are no longer necessary. The junior education minister, Millicent Radish Grief, was uh, overheard um, speaking at a press conference saying there are going to be all decent jobs for these little funding hoovers. So what's the fucking point? However, uh, there um. <laughs> There are now discussing ways of having a staggered reopening so that schools aren't overburdened and can maintain some form of social distancing. There's one option that they uh, reopen um, with uh, no children. Uh, another, they open with uh, reopen with no teachers. 
uh, and just children allowed to roam around the school uh, on their own. Um, uh, what, another, they op- reopen with uh, teachers but no lessons or teachers giving lessons at night to an empty classroom and pupils coming in during the day to just osmose the learning, the waves of learning that are still rebounding around the room. Um, <laughs> another, there'll be um, children will have to uh, have classes individually, but so that, say, a, a class of children, uh, say 30 children, can get through uh, an entire lesson. They're each going to be taught massively intensively for 90 seconds of furious teaching each um uh, another option to try and you know, keep uh, keep control of uh, social distancing is a reduced syllabus in which children are only allowed to learn one subject for the rest of their school careers that subject of course being uh, being drama because as discussed that is the skill they're going to need the ability to pretend that they're living happy and fulfilled working lives uh, regarding um Exams, um, there's uh, you know, a lot of con- kind of confusion of exactly how uh, all the exams that are no longer going to be done are going to be marked. And the latest proposal from the government is to use Victorian phrenology um, to work out how well the children would have done in their exams based on the shape of their heads. Um, it, it seems as good a way as any. You know, we're going back to the old ways in so many different facets of life. This seems, uh, seems the logical step. So here's some great news out of Australia. A book has been, a children's book has been commissioned to be published as a film. The children's book Nullabaloo Hullabaloo, which was written in Bunaloo in Australia. <laughs> uh, the author, Fleur Ferris, she grew up on a small farm in Patchy Wallach in <laughs> northwest Victoria before moving to Melbourne and then to Bunaloo. Apparently it's going to be made into a, a Hollywood movie. And I, I have no jokes about it. I just like <laughs> saying those words. <laughs> This is how I picture all Australian news. <laughs> like, to be a newspaper in Australia is just like, hullabaloo, mullabaloo, and kind of a do. <laughs> and then a politician says something obscenely racist. <laughs> well, the author Fleur Ferris was a, was a policewoman in Melbourne and then a paramedic, so she'd just seen too many bad things. So she retired to Bunaloo to write this children's book. <laughs> Uh, to conclude our Bugle Children's section, the latest instalment of our Bugle Homeschool Exams. Um, obviously, uh, school exams have been stopped, but we at the Bugle are, as a fount of all learning, uh, uh, helping anyone who is homeschooling with a, a series of uh, exams to keep their uh, children educated and informed. This week, geography. Get your pens and papers ready. Question one. Are rivers a metaphor for life? They start off fresh, exciting, running around all over the place. Then they settle down and end up meandering, getting fat and then just giving up. Uh, Question two. Using maps, graphs and pictograms, outline the correlation between tectonic fault lines and A. Snake populations, B. Hip-hop stars, C. The production of world snooker champions and D. Ice cream flavours. Question three. Outline the geological evidence presented in an influential late 1960s research paper by the seismologists Terrell and Gay that the world is a great big onion. If Terrell and Gay were correct in their assumptions, will global warming in fact make the planet smell absolutely awesome, like a giant fast food van at a sporting event? (laughs) Yum. And uh, finally, uh, question four. If you had to install a new mountain range somewhere in the world, where would it be and why? Choose from the following options. A new Ural Mountains... The current Urals are a piss-poor mountain range to divide two such famous continents. B, uh, along the netherlando Belgiamic border, the shifo Rijkaard range, uh, going up to 5,000 metres in height, could be installed overnight, really just to see the looks on the faces of people who are used to cycling everywhere without having to go uphill. C, uh, a new mountain range in Central Asia called the Herulayas to partner the Himalayas but break <laughs> the patriarchy of mountain ranges. Uh, or D, uh, across the English Channel. If we're going to do Brexit, let's f***ing do it properly. <laughs> Virus around the world news now, and um, well, it's not getting any uh, any better, uh, really. Um, this 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 story it might be getting slightly better in the short term, but it seems to be getting bleaker and bleaker uh, long term. Um, the United Nations Agency, the International Labour Organization, has warned that almost half of the global workforce. Uh, that's 1.6 billion people are in quotes immediate danger of having their livelihoods destroyed due to the economic impact of uh, the virus, the uh, pesky little influenza parody virus jerk that has ground humanity to a quivering standstill with its morally abominable microscopic guerrilla campaign of sometimes symptomless terror. It served the world an unwanted, undrinkable cocktail of mayhem, stagnation and slow motion panic without even a parasol or slice of lime to pep it up. And the world's economic house of straw is being thoroughly blown down. 
by an invisibly small big bad wolf. Uh, lessons should be learned. Next time we should <laughs> definitely, definitely build our economy out of uh, wood. <laughs> If half the world loses their job, I, I mean, that's going to be terrible individually and for the for the greater economy. Uh, but we should really spare a thought for the other half of people who just have to keep f***ing going to work while no one else is. <laughs> just getting up in the morning like this shit again. <laughs> I think we need more creative solutions. Don't cut the total number of jobs in half. Just keep everybody going to work two and a half days a week. That's a win-win. That is, I mean, that is a genuinely good solution. Um, Thank you. I think. I mean, uh, in fact, you could even spread it out because, I mean, that's three point three billion is the working population of the world. Mm-hmm. So that's still uh, that's well less than half the world's population. So if mm-hmm. we just get uh, you know children and old people working again as well, I think everyone could be a, basically on a one day working week, six day weekends. We can build a better planet. Oh, all the tourism that's going to get done on a six-day weekend, all the shopping. The economy is going to be booming with people working one day a week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to work that way at all, Andy. I think what's going to happen is we are going to invent new jobs. We are constantly inventing new jobs. Who would have thought even five years ago that there'd be such a thing as a social media image consultant? <laughs> and yet, now there's more than 95% of the world's population has that job. <laughs> Well, in the United States, they're going to create some new jobs where 50% of the working population will be conducting celebratory flyovers to salute the other 50% who are doing essential jobs. They did that this week. There was a flyover over New Jersey and New York to salute essential workers. And the only way that could have been less effective is if they had started shooting bullets down at the disease. Well... I mean, we're doing better than before the suffrage, you know. Back in the olden days, I don't know if you remember, Andy, uh, 51% of the world didn't have jobs. And in fact, we're not allowed to have jobs. (laughs) (laughs) It's bad already. I read this. This is true. Uh, 100,000 Hollywood actors are currently out of work. And tragically, among them, (laughs) 32,000 Hemsworths. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure that's that's an old measure of weight isn't it the hemsworth the hemsworth yeah it's like uh 215 230 depending on what they're training for <laughs> i'd like to buy a hemsworth of coal <laughs> the uh the ship was pulled over with 10 hemsworths of cocaine in the stow <laughs> Well, but, there's a knock-on effect, of course, because the more Hemsworths you take out of the economy, the less female lubrication there is. <laughs> this could be the driest year on record. Wildfires abound. <laughs> Bushfires, we call them in the family. <laughs> family show. Family show. Chris, don't applaud that. Do not applaud that. Um, <laughs> I'm not here for standards. You're, you're just encouraging her. Um uh, it's interesting the, the the jobs the new jobs that may emerge from from the mayhem to replace the uh, the jobs and businesses that are that are uh, dissolving before our eyes. Uh, I mean, in, in Britain certainly there is there is hope that uh, people working for all the official inquiries into everything we f***ed up uh, in this crisis could could provide employment for between two and three million people in the USA. That could be up to thirty five to forty million people. Um, other jobs that could uh, come into a being panic planners we have wedding planners i mean so you can have another unnecessary planning industry uh, advising people uh, to what to panic by when the next crisis uh, arises so uh, research and development there's going to be a lot of scientific research and development emerging in the aftermath of this uh, developing technologies to help us through future epidemics uh, including uh, scientists needed to develop a powdered hospital uh, which you can just keep in a silo and then just add water <laughs> and uh, it will just turn back into a hospital <laughs> as soon as you need it and uh, codger cocoons if you can uh, an automated automated cryonic freezing pod for the old to live in so that when a a virus breaks out they can just be uh, put into suspended animation for as long as it takes surely that's more humane than what we're doing at the moment a hypochondria (laughs) consultant Uh, i think hypochondria (laughs) consultancy is going to be one of the big growth industries of the next 10 years uh, to help people worry about um, other things and the things they really should be worrying about it's a very valuable life skill and in terms of manufacturing I think the big growth sector is going to be zorbing balls. Because when you think of the social (laughs) distancing regulations that we're going to need to observe, but also the need to 
transport ourselves physically from place to place to get the economy going again, the Zorbing Ball is the perfect compromise because basically it keeps you in your own protected, hermetically sealed, virus-free zone at approximately a two-metre range from everyone else in Zorbing Balls. This is the way to get the world moving again. Zorb- we need manufacture my 8 billion zorbing balls and this planet can get back to business there are no downsides to this apart from uphills uphills might be tricky but there are <laughs> other than the uh, the f- physical downside upsides there are absolutely no downsides to it i anticipate a big boom in uh, in the work for hula hoopists just large hula hoopists keeping each other at a distance and also uh, medieval knights with full jousting armor <laughs> No one's going to cough at you if you're thundering towards them at 50 kilometres an hour on a war horse. <laughs> Trump sent 1,000 suits of, uh, of medieval armour to New York at Cuomo's request. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's, uh, since you, you mentioned your, uh, your glorious leader, um, mm-hmm. uh, Josh, uh, he's... Uh, been on characteristically terrifying form uh, this week. Um, he's claimed to have seen evidence that the coronavirus is basically an act of biological war by China, evidence that his own scientists have not seen or or produced. Um, do we just have to accept that the credibility, the threshold of credibility for evidence in the court of Trump is different to a court of law or a scientific research paper? Well, I'm seeing a lot of headlines that say Trump suspects certain things about the virus, which is like the wrong uh, word, because that implies he's capable of deductive reasoning, if you can suspect something. He (laughs) babbled that maybe the disease came from a uh, lab in China, or he ejaculated that, or he... um, hormonally intuited it's all it's all very uh kind of animal brain with him so i think we just have to choose our verbs more carefully the standards of his of his believing something are just that the the flicker of a synapse in his brain suggested that it might be true and it doesn't matter where that synapse came from he could have he could have stuck his fingers in an electrical socket for all i know (laughs) he just gets on tv and oh, oh sorry he just gets on tv and says whatever is in his mind for 60 minutes every night and before i saw him doing that for months i thought you know maybe dave Chappelle is going out with a little untested material a little quickly and trump is just blowing him out of the water (laughs) the thing about trump is that people keep accusing him of saying stuff when he actually doesn't say anything like all the words are very much sort of abstract impressionism it's jazz chat it's word association here's a quote he said uh, when he was asked um, he was su- he was asked if he was suggesting that the coronavirus was not naturally occurring he said no we're going to see where it is where it comes from theory from lab the bats the type of bat couldn't have been here or there a lot of theories we have people looking at it strongly scientific people intel people this is not the mat the word these are not the words of a man who knows what words mean <laughs> He, hey, let's give him some credit. He knows what words are. <laughs> he, look, he doesn't make statements, that's for sure. Statements imply sentence structure. He just does, he just does sort of, you know, this, it's, it's, it's a beautiful use of po- words in a poetic way. It's just, it's free association. The silences are where the meaning is. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of, the way he talks, it's so like stammering and fragmented. It's like, uh, someone caught him cheating on his wife with the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> well, people are always misquoting Trump. I understand why people accuse, you know, the left of misquoting Trump because it is actually impossible to quote him. You just, if you try and quote Trump, your computer auto corrects it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some breaking news from uh, from America. One of uh, America's leading oil companies uh, is stepping up to do its bit for the public coronavirus effort. The oil industry has been uh, undergoing turmoil. Uh, prices fell a little while ago below the psychologically crucial zero dollars per barrel mark. <laughs> Um, and storage is uh, almost fully full. Anyway, the oil company Lovely Butterfly, uh, which recently rebranded from its old brand name Toxico to uh, to make it sound uh, more environmentally friendly without actually doing anything to justify that tag. Uh, LB have uh, filled up Lake Nugget in the Barton King Memorial Nature Reserve on the Idaho-Kentucky border with 100,000 barrels of excess crude oil. It's the least we could do, explained Moresby Quarus, the CEO, Chief Exculpation (laughs) Officer of uh, Lovely Butterfly, uh, who added, people can just come and help themselves to free oil whilst times are tough. 
and they can probably help themselves to some free ready basted fish and birds to eat as well while they're at it. So a nice gesture from uh, a beleaguered industry. Well, there's that saying, you know, like a fish needs a bicycle. A fish doesn't need a bicycle because a fish has a car and that car is currently full of crude oil. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, Alice, uh, in Australia, um, the, the lockdown is being slightly eased. Yes, indeed. Uh, different states are doing different things. But, for example, in Australia, it's just ticked over to us being allowed to invite two people over uh, to our house so that everyone is now playing the game of who's their favourite relative um, <laughs> to invite over more than one at a time. Uh, apparently, New Zealand is not approving of our our apparent laxness because even though they seem to have completely eliminated the virus they still think uh, that we're going about things in too reckless a fashion that is a classic australian new zealand beef which if anyone knows history dates back to the mid 90s dispute between the rappers outback (laughs) shakur and the notorious kiwi and is that a joke that insults the intelligence of the show's audience and the nationality of one of its hosts yes am i capable of better i would argue i am not Um, I also two people two people over your house at a time. That is a um, a valiant effort by the Australian uh, government to jumpstart its floundering threesome industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of the few growth sectors in the global economy in the last mm-hmm. ten years. <laughs> uh, also, this week marked the two hundred fiftieth anniversary of the arrival of Captain Cook. In Australia, the uh, British uh, exploring celebrity um, who uh, spent a week or so in Australia then f***ed off to look for somewhere else, uh, Cook claimed Australia for the British Crown under the Finders Keepers rule of imperial conquest, which had a legal loophole in it that to uh, be considered to have found it, you have had to have done so within the last 30,000 years. Anything earlier didn't count. That was a loophole that uh, Britain <laughs> exploited with uh, Australia. Um, Scott Morrison, the... Um, Uh, current Prime Minister of Australia, said the date represented a merging of histories, um, which was shortly after he'd merged an annoying wasp with his newspaper. (laughs) we got to stop I mean, you say that satirically, uh, the finder's keeper's rule, but actually the the rule was called terra nullius, and it was, yeah, no one lives here, even though there were clearly people living there. (laughs) We got to stop celebrating the first time white guys show up to a non-white culture. Uh, the only exception being the Beastie Boys, who I will continue to celebrate because they didn't commit genocide. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the Venga Boys, uh, which is a little known fact. The Ven- v- Venga Boys is short for Vengeance Boys, and they are out for vengeance, and they are back. Yeah, that bus was coming, and you don't want to know what's on it. (laughs) The poor citizens of Ibiza. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, don't don't kick them while they're down. They're in the middle of that terrible techno recession. (laughs) (laughs) Right, I'm now out of cultural references uh, to deal with this bit of banter. Uh, Right, so I'm now. I I brought nothing to the table there. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. Can we talk about cricket? Uh, Here in Britain, the Prime Minister is back at work. Uh, Boris Johnson has returned to work having, uh, well, as people say, beaten the virus. I don't think he beat the virus. I think the virus beat him comfortably on points. He survived the virus because while he was supposedly beating it, the virus totally demolished the f***ing country. Uh, I guess next time, tactically, if you're looking at this as a fight, maybe don't showboat so much in the first minute of round one. You cannot psych out a virus. Uh, He's also uh, returned to work and had a baby in the meantime. His partner, uh, Carrie Simmons, has... uh, uh, um, had uh, had a baby boy. Congratulations to Simmons on her first child and to the Prime Minister on his X plus one child, where X <laughs> is a number between, I don't know, five or six and whatever. Sorry to get a bit mathematical, especially in this time of confusing statistics. Um, uh, but there is some hope, uh, though, that it will soon be possible to reduce Boris Johnson's rate of transmission down below the crucial R1 point. But I, I, we can't quite pin our hopes on that. Uh, that yet he's uh, he is however back to take control take control of our national bus that he so heroically drove into a swamp in the early days of this crisis and his own personal spin on the king canute goes paddling at the seaside story but i guess if there's one man who can drive a bus out of a swamp it's a highly trained expert with a large backup team to plan the practical and logistic side of things but boris johnson is going to be very good at shouting come on boss you can do it and waving some union jack pom-poms in encouragement. So we have a Prime Minister again. He does again. love a bus. Yeah, <laughs> he, he loves a bus. He absolutely loves a bus. Um, 
he is back. There's a feeling of relief here uh, in Britain that uh, Boris Johnson is back. Um, uh, you can, maybe you can't relate to it. Let me explain. Basically, imagine you're being anaesthetised for an operation. And just as you're going under, you see the surgeon walking in and it's Freddy Krueger wielding a chainsaw. And then you wake up mid-operation and it's no longer Krueger operating on you. Instead, it's Hannibal Lecter. It's that same feeling of relief, you know, that things... But it's a little bit better, probably. P- possibly. It's, uh, you know, anyway, it's changed. At least it's the person who technically has this job title. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lecter. R level, of course, is the language used by scientists to refer to the rate of infection per coronavirus victim. But actually, um, originally, it was historically used to refer to the levels of aggression on a pirate ship. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the Scoville scale for chilly hotness. Uh, Boris Johnson described, um, we're talking about, where, you know, at what point Britain's going to start relaxing the lockdown. He said this was the moment of maximum risk. Uh, but that is, that might be true, but it's only true because at the previous moment of maximum risk, he took some massive f***ing risks. So uh, I guess we have to acknowledge that now and take, try and make sure there is not another moment of maximum risk some point in a few months' time. He says Britain is past the peak. Um, and then carried on to say, leaving us all to enjoy a fundamentally altered world in which millions and millions of people have been upheaved in a fundamental and irreparable way. Team GB. When he says Britain is past the peak, I don't think he means for the disease. I just think he means (laughs) the nation is in decline overall. (laughs) Although I do think he would be accurate to say that that COVID-19 is past its peak. Like when you're a pandemic, how much better can you do than infecting Boris Johnson? You've peaked right there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, he has had this new baby. Everyone loves a new baby, and people are celebrating his little fruit of lust. It has to be hard for the uncounted legions of other Boris babies he may or may not have had. Do I need to say may not? Not. He definitely had the, the massive babies he so far refuses to take credit for. Uh, it's funny, though, that he refuses to take credit for the babies because he took credit for the Boris bikes, and they weren't his idea. Maybe all babies are Boris babies. He should put them on public racks for people to take and return. You know, Boris babies, they're pretty good. A little heavier than other babies, but that's the technology. <laughs> I think I think you've just outlined the future of parenting post-virus. <laughs> Um, he promised maximum transparency from the government, Boris Johnson, which is rather like hearing the Pope promising a rave with free booze, hot chicks, hot hunks and heroin. In the, I don't really believe him and I don't really want it to happen anyway. I don't want maximum transparency <laughs> now, looking into a deep void of despair about what life will be like for the foreseeable future. This is the time I want him to lie to us. Not before. Not <laughs> I, want, I want good, productive lies now. Well, Mr. Johnson said that uh, keeping the reproduction rate down is going to be absolutely vital to our recovery, and he means the virus, but I think it also serves as a word of warning to his penis. Sports news now. Uh, Well, the main sports news is there's still no f***ing sport, and this has got well beyond a joke. Um, Alice, um, I know you're obsessed, arguably to a fault, with the administration (laughs) of professional tennis. What's, uh, What's been going on there? Well, Roger Federer, backed by a number of other tennis stars, has made a plea uh, for a merger of men's and women's governing bodies in the sport of tennis. So the uh, apparently, at some point, men's and women's governing tennis bodies are going to merge. Whoa, yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like that, have. Federer, you pervert, wouldn't you? Oh, oh, yeah, put it, put it, something, 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 love. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's that. I mean, it's either this. I don't know quite what they mean by merging. Either it's this sexual congress, or maybe they're going to do like a Frankenstein-y monster thing. I'd like. I, I would love to see a four-armed, four-legged Federer Williams Frankenstein monster play mixed doubles as a single entity, like something out of Space Jam. <laughs> Also, if they do that, it solves the social distancing rule by just smashing tennis players together. <laughs> I think that that's, I think, the core of it, right? In this era of social distancing, I think Roger Federer is just desperate for any kind of merging bodies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings an end uh, to another uh, viral bugle. Thank you very much for listening, uh, buglers. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week. Um, Alice? Uh, anything to plug other than the last post, of course, which uh, carry... What, what episode are we, we up to into the... 
140? Uh, eight, eight, something like that. We've been doing one a day since the 1st of January. It's, it's so much nonsense. <laughs> Uh, but also my stand-up special Savage is available on Amazon Prime. Uh, so if you want to watch something that has me in it, you can watch that. Uh, Josh, anything uh, anything to plug? Sure. I have a new podcast called Make My Day. It's a comedy game show where one guest competes and they always win. And <laughs> uh, and my book, Nice Try, is still out. You can get it on ebook or audiobook if you don't want to have a thing delivered to your house. Uh, Buglers, thank you very much for listening. We will play you out with some more lies about our premium level voluntary subscribers to join them uh, or to contribute whatever you want to the uh, ongoing existence and independence of The Bugle. Go to thebuglepodcast.com and click the donate. Thomas Hornigold thinks glaciers are overrated. They take ages to get where they're going, they leave rubbish everywhere, and they need very specific conditions in which to exist, complains Thomas. Sure, they look pretty from a distance, he rails, but as a means of getting water from A to B, they're hopeless. Give me a proper liquid river any day. It must be said that Thomas was very disappointed as a child to discover that glaciers do not contain frozen fish. It would be logical if they did, he grumbles morosely. Dominic Lagarde's Moor once had to dissuade a theatrical impresario friend of his called Neil from attempting to launch a new musical production called The Stalagmites. The Stalagmites was due to comprise eight brave little children who helped captured RAF pilots escape from a German prisoner of war camp built into rock formations growing from the bottom of a secret cave. Neil did reluctantly accept Dominic's advice. Margaret Bell came to the rescue when the persistent, if deluded, Neil then suggested that the production might still work if the heroes were instead little insect stalagmites that bit the camp guards to distraction, thus facilitating an escape. Margaret said, Maybe you could slake your thirst, Neil, for writing musicals involving both German history and caves with Otto in the Grotto, about the 19th century statesman Otto von Bismarck's quest to unify Germany via a series of secret candlelit underground meetings with the leaders of the 39 states in the German Confederation. I'm still not sure it's a guaranteed ticket shifter, equivocated Margaret. Alexandra Schwab jumped into the breach to suggest that a more ethical and visually striking alternative production would be ETT, the Extra T-Rex Trial, a Steven Spielberg-themed courtroom drama musical about the legal wranglings over a planned double sequel combining E.T. and Jurassic Park in an alien dinosaur spectacular. Alexandra did warn Neil that he would have to drop the caves and German history shtick, though. Azalea Wilberg, as a further alternative, suggests Babushka Barbushka, a musical using the songs of Kate Bush about a Russian grandmother who travels around in a car formerly owned by the ex-American first lady, Barbara Bush. Azalea says, Musicals using songs already written by famous pop stars are popular, for whatever reason. You could even get 94-year-old Olga to drive the Bob Bush car back in time to have a secret romantic liaison with Martin Luther in the Berchtesgaden salt mine in Bavaria, if you really won't shift on the Germanico-historical subterranean theme, Neil. And to conclude our History of Germany-themed pieces of drama collection of lies today, Tony Vaillard was long convinced that Star Wars character Yoda was so called as an acronym shortening for his full name, Johannes Dahlsbrucken, a young German who was fired into another galaxy and time in a covert 1930s experiment that went disastrously wrong. It would explain why Yoda's mastery of the English language remains incomplete even at the age of 900, speculates Tony. Here endeth the lies. I'm going to bed. <laughs>